it's been the case throughout the history of the internet. We've constantly been surprised. Whoa. When we look at the internet and where it came from and where it's arrived today and where it's headed, I think it's quite clear that the engineers didn't really realize just how much this was going to change things. People thought we were crazy. I mean, that internet thing is never going to be as important as the telephone or the television. In this series, we'll journey through the past, present, and future of that revolution we call the internet. We'll go inside the hidden places, practices, and people who make it hum and ask, why do we all love it so much? This is the internet, really right here. We usually think of it as invisible, up somewhere in the cloud. But this is where the invisible becomes visible, where the intangible becomes concrete. I'm Derek Muller, and I'm in an internet exchange point, one of hundreds of places around the world where computers, networks all link up to form the global internet. What's happening in here is that countless routers and switches are receiving data from one network and they're passing it over to another network via real physical cables. So it's a network of networks, all interconnected, which is why we call it the internet. And here, you can actually reach out and physically touch it. Everything we've ever recorded, or for that matter, ever written, texted, or tumblered, passes through these global internet exchange points. It is a cosmic journey, the likes of which neither Newton, Tesla, nor Einstein could ever have fathomed. All of it traveling at the speed of light. I spend most of my working life here on the internet. Now, I know that may sound a little bit nerdy, but I actually really enjoy it. I create and host an online science channel called Veritasium, meaning the element of truth. It is my dream job because I'm passionate about science and now I can investigate topics I've always wondered about. Isn't that cool? And bring my world of science to a massive international audience. Whoa. I capitalize on the reach of the web. For example, after uploading this video called The Surprising Application of the Magnus Effect. Oh, look at that go. <laughs> It has now been viewed by more than 50 million people from around the world. Not bad for a film about a fluid dynamical effect. As a species, we have an inbuilt need to connect with others, to communicate and share our stories, to create community in essence. And the internet empowers us to do that in ways we never before imagined. In 1969, the same year that a man stepped on the moon, Leonard Kleinrock headed up a team of computer scientists later hailed as the fathers of the internet. And it all started in a room like this one. But the interesting thing is that if none of us had been born, we'd still have an internet today. It was in the air. It was going to happen. The inspiration to create a brand new network came from a branch of the Defense Department called ARPA the Advanced Research Projects Agency. Well, you know, ARPA was formed as a response to the 1957 Sputnik launch by the Russians. The Soviets had caught us with our pants down. We were behind in technology. At the time, computers were very large, very expensive, and separated by great distances. So a single user wishing to use multiple programs would have to travel to different locations. Computers need to talk to each other, and there was no way in which they were able to do so efficiently at the time. Here was the problem. If you were trying to send files or messages over a network, you'd have to put them in one at a time. So each message had to wait its turn. And if one of the messages were really big, it would take a long time to go through. The solution Leonard Kleinrock and his fellow internet pioneers came up with still lies at the heart of the internet today. It's called packet switching. 
in which all the messages are cut up into pieces of the same size, called packets. Then the packets can travel separately through the network, making the best use of every available space. So packets from small messages, well, they can squeeze into the gaps between packets from large messages, avoiding the long wait. And once those packets have reached their destination, they can be reassembled into their original messages. To do all that chopping and reassembling, a special device would connect computers to the network. This is the very first piece of internet equipment ever. This is where the internet began. It's the interface message processor. It's made out of a military hardened machine for the Department of Defense. Inside, you notice, it is so ugly, it's beautiful. It's my friend, has a unique odor, and it's really old equipment, but this is where the entire internet began, right here. The year is 1969. Richard Nixon is inaugurated as our 37th president, and more than a million people gathered at Woodstock to celebrate sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And on October 29th, Kleinrock's team at UCLA logged into a computer at the Stanford Research Institute. Now, to make sure this worked, because this was the first time these two host computers were going to talk to each other, to let somebody log in remotely, we had a telephone connection, just to be sure. Now, to log in, you have to type L-O-G. So, Charlie types the L and he says to Bill, you get the L? Bill says, got the L. Type the O, you get the O? Got the O. Type the G, crash. The system went down. The first message ever on the internet was low, as in, lo and behold. Samuel Morse had a good message on the Telegraph Network. He said, what hath God wrought? He prepared a message. He had the press and the media there. Alexander Graham Bell, Watson, telephone. Come here. come here, Watson, I need you. Neil Armstrong, giant leap for mankind. But it turns out that the message we sent was about as short, as prophetic, as powerful as you can imagine. Low, by accident. Our vision in those early days was machine to machine or person to machine. What I missed totally was that this was not about computers talking to each other. It was about people communicating with each other. By the end of 19